amazingly uh, in the book Netherlands Druglands, uh, Bart de Wever, the mayor of Antwerp, stated that uh, legalizing cocaine would be a plausible and genuine solution to ending the drug war. Coming from him, it's quite a surprise. Uh, this drug war has been raging in Antwerp for several, several years, uh, as we know, uh, uh, following also the, the, the upscaling of the drug war by Bart de Wever. Uh, but Bart de Wever immediately added that uh, he categorically refuses to, to even consider this solution that he himself presents as uh, plausible and uh, genuine. Do you think it's plausible that the Wever is uh, worried about the conflicts between rival gangs in Antwerp and it, that he really wishes to end them? Is this his real motive? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't see inside uh, sure. this man's uh, brains and personal uh, thoughts, but uh, uh, many of his, uh, his expressions and, and statements in the media show this strange... Uh, a discrepancy and, and a contradiction in, in, in what he's actually saying. Uh, because if you, on the basis of uh, scientific uh, and evidence-based materials, you decide that a war on drugs cannot be won uh, and that you are failing in tackling the drug problem, then the logic, scientific, logically conclusion would be we have to do something else than mm. a war on drugs. Yeah? So saying, I think legalizing is the best solution, but then on the ground continuing a war on drugs is, is a very strange contra contradiction. And I wonder if, uh, I, I do think that many politicians around the world who are still uh, embracing the, the, the repressive discourse and the prohibitionist logic uh, basically know that this is not uh, going to work, but that it's this often no. part of a, a kind of a, a, kind of a, a populist uh, approach, which um, uh, is, 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 is a message, message that you can sell to a certain part of the population mm -hmm. in, in telling them, I'm going to finally clean out. Uh, this mess. I'm, I'm going to finally solve the problems. This is a problem created by the previous governments, but I will finally eh, solve the problem and make sure I eradicate it. And uh, this, this whole uh, eradication hypothesis is something that uh, people were told for decades, also on the international level. Yeah. As long as we invest enough in police and in justice and in this repressive war on drugs, we will finally manage to create a drug-free world. Now, that in itself is an illusion that people would already, uh, should already know that there is no such thing as a drug-free world, as I said before. There, there are drugs in this world and we like them, or many people uh, like those drugs. And so these drugs will always be around uh, and we will have to find a way uh, to manage the phenomenon. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's very strange for me to be able to sell this message continuously to a population in the sense that he's saying, um, we're not winning the war, we actually will never win that war, but we have to do it on moral grounds. Now, I don't think a drug policy should be based on the moral grounds of individual politicians. Mm -hmm. I don't think this policy should be based on ideological considerations and value or, uh, values and norms of certain politicians. This is a debate on what works and on what does not work, and it should be evidence-based after 50 years or 60 years of trying to do the same, we should be able to look each other in the eye and say, this is not working and we know it's not working. So let's start thinking in a very, maybe even radical, different way in order to be able to tackle the problems that we see today. Mm -hmm. Uh, among the arguments in favor of regulation or legalization of cannabis and maybe other substances, there is always the desire to bypass the black market economy and drain the mafias of their, uh, their uh, profits. Uh, first, do you think it would be easy to, to do this? Uh, in other words, do you think that the mafias would just let this happen, especially in countries where they have infiltrated so deeply into state administration, the so-called narco-states? No, it will not be easy, but, uh, and, and uh, to be honest, you have to separate the war on drugs and drug consumption and the war on mafia. 
Now, the war on drugs is something that does not work eh? and uh, that we need to change. The war on mafia, the war on criminal networks is a war that you will have to uh, continually uh, wage in. So um, we have to fight criminal networks, professional criminals that exploit uh, many vulnerable people in many different ways. Uh, so these criminal groups are targets that you will always have to fight. Mm. One part of your strategy to fight uh, organized crime is exactly by taking away some of their profit uh, margins or uh, some of their opportunities to make so many profits. So uh, regulating uh, drug markets and taking away, uh, taking away sorry, this, this, this uh, huge opportunity to make a lot of money is just one element of fighting uh, organized crime. Uh, and this is not an easy uh, struggle, but you have to keep in mind that actually our policy makes organized crime even stronger eh? by not only waging a war on organized crime, but also waging a war on drugs. We make the drug market in enormously interesting uh, in terms of profits for these groups. And most of the, 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 the spectacular uh, uh, wars on drugs actually created more organized crime groups. In uh, South America, in Latin America, there was a, a huge war on drugs inspired by the US and also uh, financed by the US eh, with billions of dollars and with uh, the, the, the army sent in to, to try and destroy these cocaine cartels in Latin America. The result of that was that instead of a few large cartels, they created many smaller cartels who are also competing and very aggressive and violent against each other, but also the spreading of the, the phenomenon of organized crime over the Latin American country. So this war on drugs, Plan Colombia, uh, so many years ago, actually made the organized crime phenomenon bigger and more powerful. And this is exactly the same thing what is happening nowadays with our war on drugs here in Europe and, for example, in our country. We are creating more profit opportunities for organized crime. So we are attracting more organized crime cartels and groups to this market. They will obviously compete and be very aggressive towards another and throw grenades and shoot uh, guns and, and, and try to, to kill each other. But at the same time, they become more and more powerful. And the more powerful they become, the more they undermine our state. Organized crime, mafia has always undermined the de democratic, democratic structures. But by making them even more rich, and giving them more opportunities to, to make money, we create a, a, a more powerful monster which will undermine our democratic structures even more. We already see this eh, in some of the countries where the, the, the organized crime cartels are more powerful than uh, the, the, the state. And we, we risk to create the same monster if we continue to go along the same path. Mm -hmm. and just how bad do you think the problem is? Uh, for instance, in uh, our part, part of the world, in Antwerp specifically, because we were talking about uh, Bartow River, how far does it go right now? I think it's already going quite far, uh, um, because uh, the war on drugs, as it was reinvented eight or nine years ago, has created new uh, opportunities for organized crime uh, groups. And you can already see the indications. Uh, these groups are competing for market shares. They are trying to intimidate uh, each other. They are trying to, to lead the focus from the police forces to the competitors so that they can continue and upscale their operations. And uh, I do think that these groups are already undermining uh, the, the, uh, some of the economic sectors in, uh, in Antwerp and in the, the rest of By uh, Belgium. By infiltration in the legal part. By infiltrating. Uh, obviously, black, black money eh, uh, always has to be uh, reinvested in uh, the white economy. 
this is, has always been the case. So all the money made with drug uh, production and drug supply and drug dealing has to be reinvested, eh? money laundered and reinvested in white economic sectors. So that's why uh, there are restaurants, why there are businesses, why, why there are uh, buildings uh, bought by these families and these groups, uh, etc. So it's already happening. Couldn't you argue that it's good for the GDP of a country? Yes, but I prefer uh, a, a sound and healthy uh, economy uh, and not uh, an economy which, which seems healthy, but which is actually run by straw people for organized crime groups. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk also about the, the small people, the little helpers, uh, as you could call them. Uh, these young gang recruits uh, with no future who provide, in fact, what they are doing is providing for their families through criminal activity, but they need to live as well. So uh, in the transition to a legal model or a regulated model, what to do with these people? How, how do you convert their activity into something uh, honorable? Yeah. I mean, the first thing that we need to do is to make a, a difference uh, between different types of drug-related crime. Eh? Because now we often think, uh, and also the, 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 the legal system thinks about Uh, drug-related crime as one container concept, which includes the use and the possession of drugs, the, the, the buying of drugs, but also the street dealing eh, and the, the low-level uh, dealers that are involved in the trade. And then there's people that uh, commit all kinds of crimes just to finance their drug habit or their drug consumption pattern, etc. And there is the, the, the investors and the coordinators of, of, the, of the, the large trafficking operations. I do think that our penal system and our penal law should make a distinction between these types of drug-related crime. As we, we discussed before, possession and consumption of a drug should not even be in the penal law anymore. But uh, crimes related to street dealing, to low-level uh, involvement in the drug trade, should be punished much less than the very violent drug-related crimes. And uh, the, 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 king, the, the, the kingpins, mm -hmm. the investors, the coordinators. One, one of the problems that I have with our current approach is that while we wage a war on drugs, in the facts, it is basically a war on drug users, drug, cons drug consumers, and a war on the low level uh, drug dealers, the ones that are on the bottom, in the bottom of the, the drug trafficking chain. And we know that this level uh, of people uh, that are involved there are the vulnerable people. Are the vulnerable people? These are the have-nots. These are the ones used by the smart people on uh, at the top, by the kingpins, by the coordinators. They corrupt them with some easy money. They uh, force them. They uh, they entice them. And then once they're in the game, they don't let them leave uh, in, uh, out of that game. So. These are, these are uh, very vulnerable, often economically vulnerable people. You see that in the cannabis market, that uh, farmers who are in financial troubles are approached by uh, organized crime groups to grow cannabis in their barns and uh, etc. These are people who are experiencing financial, financial problems and then they approach these people to do things for them. Same thing with many of the people in, in the Antwerp port. The, the, the strad straddler carriers, the, 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 the people working uh, uh, in, in, in the docks in the Antwerp port, uh, the mafia and the organized crime looks for those people who have financial problems, mm -hmm. uh, the ones do, that are uh, suffering from a divorce or have some gambling uh, debts or whatever. They, they, they look for that kind of people and then they entice them with some easy money. Mm -hmm. Basically, these are vulnerable people. It also shows, uh, in, in, in my uh, opinion, that drug policy should be a part of a much broader policy, a social policy. Much of the problems that we see that feed uh, uh, on social problems. Uh, a lot of people who are experiencing social problems are getting into drug-related problems. They start dealing, they start consuming too much, uh, etc. Uh, so uh, a lot of people who are excluded from, from society, who are very vulnerable in society, they are the ones that fall prey to addiction, dependence, 
uh, low level dealing, uh, etc., more than other people. Mm. So, uh, drug policy should be also part of a much broader uh, social policy. We should not have a war on drugs, we should have a war on poverty. We should work on housing, we should on wor on work on proper inclusion of groups. Just to give you one uh, terrible example, actually, is our prison system. We lock up, we imprison a large number of people for a very long time in an institution which does not really work on re-socializing, reintegrating people. So people who are already vulnerable and committed crimes and did you know, uh, things that were wrong uh, are sent to institutions which are like the medieval uh, holes in the ground where it threw people in and then tried to forget about them for many years. This, our prison system today is uh, like that system. We throw people in there in usually very inhumane conditions and there is almost no investment and effort in re-socializing, in helping these people to find the way back to society and get integrated. On the contrary, they learn more about what they can do uh, uh, in terms of crime. They get to know, they get involved with drugs only to survive the prison conditions. So um, as long as this war on drug translates into a, a war on the most powerless and vulnerable populations, we actually create the problems of the next generation. Okay? And uh, this, is, uh, this is another element, of course, of the current debates. If you then legalize and regulate, you have to make sure that the populations that were targeted the most by this war on drugs and that uh, bore most of the, of the burden of criminalization, those that were sent to prison, those that were excluded from society, you have to include them in your regulated market. Mm -hmm. And this is one uh, enormous danger that even when a society decides to regulate a market, it then becomes the market of the white collar business people, mm -hmm. upper class businessmen. And again, excluding those pockets of society who were under prohibition, the populations that were targeted the most and were punished the most. Yeah. And so this is, this is an important issue of social equity. And it also relates to, uh, um, so drug policy also relates to uh, development policy. If we want the supply of cocaine coming from Latin America to here to slow down, we have to find solutions for those poor farmers that have no other means of existence than to produce illegal cocaine. Then we have to find exit strategies for marijuana farmers in the Rift Mountains in Morocco. Uh, you cannot just spray their fields and you know, tell them to figure out how to, to make a living for their families. Because there's hundreds of thousands of people who have only one way to survive, and it's to be involved in drug production uh, and drug uh, trafficking. So if you want really to do something about this phenomenon, you have to create much more exit strategies and alternative livelihoods for these populations.